Good evening, everybody. Thank you for seeing me on such short notice. Um, uh, today I'm here to talk to you and lecture you a little bit about something I found very interesting when I was at NC State. And I wrote a little bit of my thesis on it and it was the rise of power of Octavian Augustus within Rome. How you go from a triumvirate to a republic to an empire without anybody contesting you or complaining about your rise to power. Now I'm gonna start out, obviously, to talk about the first and second triumvirates, just to give a little bit of backstory to Octavian. Nothing that needs to be noted too heavily. Uh, it's more so just to see where he was because most of the actions he takes come after the end of the second triumvirate. And that's where he starts to work heavily on reforming the Senate, uh, reforming the military, and reforming the economy and society in general. So to start the first triumvirate, was that of Julius Caesar's. We all know the name. He was part of a triumvirate, which is three people who ruled uh, Rome. They split up Rome evenly. Uh, after a little bit of instability due to jealousy of who got what territory or what wealth came from one compared to another, uh, there was some infighting between the um, triumphant lords and Caesar ended up winning and naming himself emperor. Now we all remember the saying, you too, Brutus, he goes into the Senate and is stabbed by a senator named Brutus and some other senators that were very prominent at the time and Caesar dies. With this, the Senate doesn't know really what to do because they had been transformed into an empire. They didn't know what powers they had. So they sort of reverted uh, the Roman Empire back to the Roman Second Triumvirate. And this contained Octavian, who was the greatest politician of the time, Mark Anthony, who was the greatest general of the time, and Lepidius, who was the richest man of Rome. Octavian was given the main part and main body of Italy, while Mark Anthony was given Greece and Egypt, which were arguably the most profitable areas, but the most uh, contested due to war. And then Lepidius was given uh, parts of Gaul, which is known as France, uh, the area, peninsula of Spain, Portugal, parts of England, and some of the German Low Countries. So he had the most territory, but had the least profit coming from it. Lepidius, who was a businessman, and was the richest man of Rome, was a little upset that he, while well, got the most land, got the least profit and least bang for his buck. So he went to war with Octavian. And what he tried to do was take the, uh, the island of Sicily, which is just off the Italian boot, and Octavian uh, opposed him and eventually won uh, multiple battles and ended Lepidius by killing him. Octavian now ruled the Roman main body, which is the Italian boot, and then the, east, or the western part of Europe, and all the military and navy that ensued with the defeat of Lepidius. He goes to the Roman Senate and says, look, there's obviously a problem with the triumvirate. We saw it the first time. Caesar went uh, to war with everybody, ended up winning, named himself emperor. And Lepidius just tried to do the same thing, and I, I stopped him. Now, I don't want to be an emperor, and I don't want to be part of the triumvirate. And I see the issues that this comes with Rome. So I'm going to go to war and defeat Mark Anthony, and then report back here, and restore the Republic. Give the, all the powers back to the Senate, and we're gonna go back to the early days of Rome. Well, the Roman Senate was very interested in this because obviously this meant more power for them and less power for uh, people like Mark Anthony, who was just a military mind. They say, okay, you have our support. He eventually goes to war, and after a major battle of uh, Actium, which was just outside of Greece, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra were defeated. So all that remains is Octavian from the second triumvirate. And as he said, he goes back to the Senate and says, look, I've defeated him. Here is your power. I'm giving everything back. All I ask is that I become part of the Senate again so I can have some say of what goes on in, into Rome because I love um, this Republic so much. Well, this is the beginning of his interest within the Senate and uh, his sort of reforms. 
So the Senate, being gracious of what had been given to them, they say, okay, Octavian, thank you for the Republic. We're gonna give you some accolades that uh, few have held before you, but it will make you very prestigious. And in a society like Rome, and even Greece, Egypt, and even some of the Asian countries, prestige was a major thing that was on the mind of many people. So you have um, the Senate giving this head of state ability to Octavian. Now, this is kind of uh, equivalent to being the president of the United States. You have this veto power. The Senate is going to pass some type of legislator or bill or whatever it may be in Rome. And if Octavian doesn't like it because he's such a great political mind, they can trust that he'll say, okay, this isn't good for Rome or these need to be the changes. And he'll veto the, the bill or legislation and have them rewrite what they want to do. In practice, sounds great, but really what you're doing is you're giving all the power to one person and not much of a check because there's no way around the veto. Now you think Octavian controls the Senate now, but it's going to get even more impressive later. He was also given the accolade of being the head of religion, which had only come with some of the tyrants and even Caesar before, who was the emperor. Um, not really a political accolade, but one that brought even more prestige to the name of Octavian. He was also uh, granted the power of the military. While he was not a military mind, was not a general, they had seen what he had done and noticed that he had Rome's best interests um, in mind. So they gave him 28 out of the 32 legions, which is a grand majority of the Roman military, and says, look, there are some unruly parts of Rome. There, there are uh, the Greek city-states that keep rebelling. There's the Middle East, who are always fighting back with the, the Persian body. Uh, you got uh, the Gauls in France and even the English that don't like us and the Germans above us. We're gonna let you control the half of the territories in Rome, half of them in completion, that are unruly. And you have all the military to do so. Do what you must. And then we, the Senate, will control the other half. So Octavian originally went from having one third of um, the Roman Republic and now contains one half of it without even having to do anything. It was granted to him. So the last thing he needs to do for the Senate is make them completely under his control because he does have his political opponents within them. So he does what is known as the senatorial purges. He goes in there and says, look, I'm the great Octavian Augustus. There are 1,100 senators here. And when Rome started, there were only 300. Now it's not a growing population we have so many senators, it's just because we've become more corrupt. And you and I both know that. Now I may not be corrupt, but you may be. So I'm giving you the opportunity to keep the prestige that we talked about, where um, the family wanted to be as wealthy and hold as much land as possible because it was better to be well known than to be a nobody. He says, you can keep the prestige, just leave the Senate. You'll remain a senator without having to do any of the work. So about 500 took him up on the offer. You know, I, I would too, because you get paid to really do nothing. And that's sort of what everybody's goal is. Um, so the Senate is down to 600. That's still not enough for Octavian. He still has opponents. So he needs to whittle it down even more. But he remembers what happened with Caesar when he got too aggressive with the Senate. Brutus and many of the other leading senators killed him. So what does Octavian do? He dresses in all armor, as much as he can give. He comes in holding a sword and a spear. He comes in with military by his side and a few personal bodyguards who are also heavily armed and says, listen, I've locked the doors here at the Senate. And I'm just using that as a figure of speech. You guys are here and some of you are not supposed to be here. You still have not left. This is your final chance to leave with your prestige. And if you don't, then we will have a vote within the Senate. And if you don't win the vote to stay, I will kill you. 
So obviously a lot of them leave. They don't want to get killed. And they're just going to take the deal that Octane is given. Those that stayed know they're safe because they are personally allied with Octavian. So about 350 remain in the Senate, and every single one of them is loyal to Octavian. None of, none of them oppose him. They all want to rule in the same manner he does. They all have the same political aspirations and beliefs. Maybe not to be emperor, like Octavian, but nobody had known his plan. So the Senate now passes whatever he wants, and even if he doesn't agree, he still has a veto. So this leads to uh, his next step is controlling the military. Um, in, in the past, tyrants have been known to rule Rome, and a tyrant is basically one of those Roman generals that took his military, who was loyal to him and not Rome itself, and would sack Rome and name themselves leader until they were opposed. So you need to get around this issue to where um, the soldiers and veterans were not loyal to Rome itself. So he makes a simple plan to do so, and what it is, is he gives them land upon exiting the military after the 20 years they serve, and he also gives them wealth. So he is the one that pays their salary, they are loyal to him and the Senate, and also the money and land that's given to them upon exiting the military after serving for some odd years are enough to create a farm or some sort of business that would interest them and allow them to reintegrate themselves into Roman society because after all, for 20 years or so, they were on the outskirts of Rome, they were in Egypt and Middle East and, and Gaul and, and the German Low Countries, they weren't in the body of Rome and the land that was given to them was in Italy, in the Italian boot. And this was very sought after uh, land because it was a position within Italy which you had to live within Italy to be considered a Roman citizen, as well as you had a bunch of wealth that accompanied it. Accompanied it. And this goes more into the economy because their land actually even more so improved as the economy improved. So what did Octavian do with his military? Well, he created a very strong navy and then policed the Mediterranean, allowing a better form of um, trade uh, because there was no piracy going on. So now goods could be shipped from uh, Egypt to the heart of Rome reliably. And Egypt was very profitable, so they brought in a lot of goods and a lot of wealth and eventually made Rome quite wealthy. It wasn't just the Mediterranean that he policed, but he also used his Roman garrisons and his uh, legions to um, defend the road systems that he created within, um, within Europe's uh, main body. So he had road systems that went all the way up into what is now modern day Paris and had road systems that went all the way into Athens and even parts of Turkey. This allowed goods to be traded not by water, but also by land, and they were also protected by the military. All this wealth coming into Rome made all the Roman citizens in general very happy because they became quite wealthy. Now, Octavian, with all the money that's going into the Senate, decides let's we'll spend it on something, let's we'll reward Rome for what they've given us. So what does he do? He pretty much overlays Rome in complete marble and gold, completely beautifies it, and glorifies Rome itself, uh, making the standard of living quite a bit higher. He also, when it comes to the citizens, abolished tax farming. And this was an issue that plagued Julius Caesar in the First Empire. And that was because um, tax farming is essentially when the, um, the Republic or the Senate decide Empire or the Republic is too big. We can't properly collect taxes. So we're gonna find some of the wealthy individuals that we can trust and say, hey, go collect taxes for us. And what they would do was they would charge all the citizens with taxes, but with a fee on top of it, because the civilians would give them all these taxes and they would cut off the fee portion that they asked for, and it would make them incredibly wealthy because everybody's then paying them, and then Rome is paying them as well for them to collect taxes, and then they're giving the tax money to Rome. So they they sort of exploited the citizens, and the citizens were not very happy, and a lot of 
civilian revolts happen, especially within Egypt. So by abolishing tax farming, you never see these, uh, these civilian uprisings anymore. And also to prevent civilian uprisings, he creates a civilian police force and that's called the, the Night Watch or we'll call it the Roman police. And what it is, is a little prestigious um, accolade and job to hold. And what your job is to monitor and end disputes before they become violent or dangerous. And if riots were to ensue, to report them to the military or put them down before the uh, riots became dangerous to Rome and the Republic itself. So what has Octavian done? He has controlled the Senate and made everybody within the Senate completely loyal to him, as well as the ability to say no to anything they pass. He controls all of the military in a, almost all of the provinces and has made the military not loyal to a general, not loyal to their comrades, but loyal to the Senate and to Rome itself because that's where they were invested. And then using the military as a way to boost the economy, he created a lavish lifestyle for many of the Roman citizens and made it in general, um, more wealthy and advantageous to be part of Rome itself, which helped uh, defend and protect some of the unruly areas as they became a little more docile and tame. So without any citizens to oppose him, without any military to rise against him, and without any Senate to vote him out of his position, Octavian holds all the power. And finally, after all this is complete, the Senate then grants Octavian Augustus with the title of Emperor, in which he does not refuse. Thank you for your time. Uh, are there any questions about Octavian Augustus?